I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. During the last couple days, uh, there were many times, and it was getting more and more that way, that I felt, in a technical term, rather discombobulated. Like, I guess that picture of the Garfield cartoon of the cat, you know, pushed up against the glass. <laughs> many, many different like qualities. Uh, getting stuff done under time pressure, preoccupied with worrying about different people I know, uh, fascinated with the political uh, dynamics in America these days, clicking from one thing to another. Blah, 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 blah. And I was just minded um, yesterday toward the end of the day and reminded of the Buddha's extremely fundamental teaching around whoosh, stabilizing and taking stock. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of content, of words and points made in um, the record of the Buddha's teachings that have to do with what could be called steadiness of mind, a stability of presence. You may know that in Buddhism, um, the three pillars of practice are described as, um, in a key language of early Buddhism, Pali, P-A-L-I, they are described as uh, sila, samadhi, and panya. Sila could be translated variously as restraint. There's a kind of stability there already. And a virtue, morality, um, commitment to non-harming and to promoting the good for oneself and for others, sila. Then second, samadhi is about mental training and concentration. Uh, including in the depths of deep concentration, meditatively, and absorption, a stillness of awareness. Uh, that's one of the three, the big three right there. And the third, panya, is translated typically as wisdom. Wisdom that recognizes that everything's impermanent, it's made of parts that are related and changing, thus empty of absolute selfness and wisdom that recognizes that when we resist the flow of life, we suffer and create harm, and that when we um, come into harmony with the nature of things, uh, we do a lot better. So in all that, we have this, if you will, central pillar of stability, steadiness of mind, and um, coming to a kind of stillness. And as soon as I remembered that, <laughs> Duh, I started uh, doing better. I kind of slowed it down. I stabilized my commitment to um, meditating more and including um, in this last night's case before going to bed and um, just really appreciating the value of steadiness of presence. So I want to talk about that with you. I want to talk about that with you here. And uh, as usual, I have a little list and not as usual. I'm actually going to slow it down, and I may not, and in fact, I don't expect to get through my whole list tonight, of five ways to cultivate stability of presence. Now, to be clear, we can use this stability of presence to help our minds be so quiet and clear that we can really see the granularity of the machinery of the mind in a way that, wow, liberates us from it. That's fantastic. I'm mainly going to focus on developing this greater stability of presence to feel not so stressed or distracted, not so compelled and carried away by all the shiny objects in the culture, um, not so rattled by reactions from the past. Um, I'm talking about cultivating this stability of presence uh, for very, very down-to-earth practical reasons. And to begin with one of those practical reasons, I'd like to respond to a question that came in. What about trauma-sensitive mindfulness? 
Uh, this is a term that's increasingly being used these days in sort of mindfulness circles, in part as a, a reaction appropriately to some of the excesses of an, an early eagerness to pop the lid on everything inside and be mindful of everything, including in highly intensive and not always very supportive environments, like being in a meditation retreat in silence, in which for the teachers, it's really hard to know, unless someone um, communicates it, what's really going on deep down inside people. So David Trelevin, he's uh, written about trauma-sensitive mindfulness, wonderful being and teacher. I think actually we may have interviewed David, maybe Forrest interviewed him in the Being Well podcast. You might be able to get some um, interviews there. And there's more material about it. What I would say in particular that one of the great resources for dealing with trauma material is stability of presence. That sense of a trustworthy, like a mountain core that is not swept away by the trauma. It witnesses the trauma. The stability of presence witnesses the trauma. It feels the feelings without being invaded by them, right? The Buddha talked about many, many painful, painful experiences and feelings he had in his own journey toward enlightenment and then added, but they did not invade my mind and remain in the core of his being. So the stability of presence is really helpful here. Additionally, that stability of presence uh, makes room for an inner wisdom that says, you know, I'm not going to go open that door to the basement of my mind right now where that scary stuff is. I'm just not going to do that. I've done enough on this. I need more resources outside me and inside me to grapple with all this. You know, when we're distracted, when we're chasing one thing after another, when we're ruminating, caught up in that, there's not much room. It's so noisy. It's so cluttered. It's really hard for that quiet, loving, self-nurturing clarity to emerge. But it can emerge when we've established the stability of presence. So I'd like to talk about three ways to establish your own greater stability of presence. We know it when we see it, right? We see it in others. They're in life, things are happening, but there's, there's an inner calm in them. They're present, they're not distracted. Um, there's a dignity in them a kind of self-respect, a beingness. We can see it in them, and we can grow more and more of that inside ourselves. So the first of five, and I'll probably just get through three tonight, and then we'll explore, um, we'll review the three and explore the remaining two probably next week. We'll see. Uh, the first of these is intention. If one going down into a river that is swift, swollen and swiftly flowing, if one is carried away by the current, how can one help others across? It's one of my favorite quotations in the Buddha Dharma. There's this fundamental position uh, in Buddhism about taking responsibility for our own life. A few uh, sessions ago, I talked about um, taking existential responsibility for one's life. It's certainly very central to Buddhist teaching and many other teachings. That existential responsibility acknowledges the many ways we're being buffeted and pushed, understandably, by events and conditions, injustice, pressures, and all the rest of that, and our own you know, genetic and condition nature. Yes, and in the context of all that, we can still take a fundamental responsibility for how we want to relate to it and how we want to help ourselves uh, in the minutes and years to come. And to claim that responsibility and to 
uh, permit ourselves to claim it and to celebrate it is really given here uh, in this quotation that uh, if we're going to help others, we certainly have to help ourselves too. It's a very clear and pointed teaching of the Buddha that nor, no mother, nor father, nor any other kin can do greater good for oneself than a mind directed well. So in intending, we have both the top-down emphasis on being deliberate, talking to ourselves in a kind way, not a critical way, not a pushy way, and still a guiding kind of way. Stability of presence, steadiness of mind, being here now, not swept away, not overindulging, you know, my fantasies about this or that or my resentments about them or them. Boom. Top down, there's a place for that. Maybe even more importantly, there's a place for what I might call a kind of bottom-up intentionality. Instead of pushing ourselves in a certain direction, for which there is a place, but it's kind of exhausting over time, much better is to be pulled along by the, the rising currents from within us that lean into a way of being because it we appreciate it and we give ourselves over to what it would feel like, what it would be like if our intention were fulfilled. What would it feel like to be stably present? Steadily present. What would that feel like and how would it feel good? And can we give ourselves over to that way of being? That's a bottom-up kind of intending. And I want to, in a way, ask you directly, in the innermost, you know, um, sanctuary of your own being, to what extent has steadiness of mind been a value for you? Honestly. To what extent have you taken it seriously and sought to cultivate it? To what extent has it been a, something you've cared about? And I can say, certainly, in my own, I started meditating in 1974, off and on, certainly for the initial years, and then pretty continuously on now for about 30 years or more. Um, you know, when one of my teachers, Christina Feldman, talked about steadiness of mind, it really was galvanizing because I really had not ever heard um, firm, <laughs> clear teachings on that matter. Uh, I had not valued it prior to that. And since then, my own practice, one of the major qualitative, you know, kind of steps up, for me happened when I really started to value the samadhi pillar of practice and um, the development of steadiness of mind. So you might ask yourself, what has been your intention and what is your intention from here? Now, it's really important when we set an intention that we don't, um, that we're not harsh to ourselves. There's a Zen saying that we should be with our minds like the skillful rider of a horse, neither too tight nor to loose a rein. What's that middle place, right? Where um, you are not too tight nor to loose a rein. And so here's a quotation that I find really touching. Uh, the Devata, Devata a being coming to the Buddha and um, says, how, dear sir, did you cross the flood? Flood being ordinary circumstances, uh, ordinary distraction and suffering, uh, you know, not crossing the river of suffering over to the other side, to that unshakable sanctuary of awakening. So the Buddha is being asked a question. And his reply is, by not halting, friend, and by not straining, I cross the flood. You can feel it. 
This is the way to have intention, neither halting nor straining. He was asked, but how is it, dear sir, that by not halting and by not straining, you crossed the flood? The Buddha replied, when I came to a standstill, I sank. When I halted, I sank. And when I struggled, I strained. I was swept away. It is in this way, friend, that by not halting and not straining, I crossed the flood. In other words, by not halting and sinking, nor straining and struggling and getting swept away, that's how we cross the flood. I just like it because I've crossed rivers. <laughs> you may have too. <laughs> and, you know, you could feel that mid place where if you just sort of halt and uh, you can just kind of sink in. But if you fight it, you know, you can get swept away. It's that middle place. That's the real approach to having an intention about your own steadiness of mind. So I really invite you to be quiet with me for half a minute or so, as you just feel into both top-down, giving yourself instructions, and bottom-up, opening and appreciating what it would feel like to, to live more and more in the fulfillment of this intention, establishing your intentions for steadiness of mind. What do you really want in this regard in the remainder of your life? Okay. So, second, after the factor of intention, and really appreciating how important intention is, and finding that wise place where we're neither um, being lackadaisical about our intention nor straining and straining, that middle place, that's really, really central. It's really valuable. It's interesting that in the Eightfold Path, uh, right after wise view comes wise intention. Okay. The next one is about calm. Two quotations here. Um, <clears throat> the first from the Dhammapada. Wonderful it is to train the mind so swiftly moving, seizing whatever it wants. Good it is to have a well-trained mind, for a well-trained mind brings happiness. So we have here, obviously, the point about training. And in particular, we have the recognition of the mind chasing one thing after another. That's kind of its biological design plan, right? To scan for threats, to look for opportunities, fight or flee or freeze or appease in the face of threats, you know, chase after uh, opportunities, cling to others, Oh, it's kind of a madhouse in there. It's busy in there, right? And um, it's really helpful and humbling to just appreciate this chasing after shiny objects and instead increasingly disengage from that chase and rest in a growing calm, which really promotes steadiness of mind. It's hard to have steadiness of mind when we're uh, distracted by this or that, when we're stressed, and rattled and frazzled when we're, you know, ruminating about the things we feel threatened about or resentful of or worried about. Bleh. So it's important, obviously, to address our problems and take action. You know, action binds anxiety, as Angela Sarian put it, and um, to take refuge in the calming knowing that we're doing what we can for ourselves 
and others. There's a, it's really important. Take action, obviously. Having said that, now focusing on the inner world, there are multiple ways to help ourselves calm. I explored some of them with you in the meditation. All right. Tuning in to um, the uh, reassuring ongoingness of being and breathing. Still here. All right, right now. That's very calming. Another thing that's very calming is to um, look out at the busy world and inside our own being, our own heart, take seclusion. That word is often used in the teachings of the Buddha. Seclude it, not running away from, not putting up barriers against, just like giving yourself the right to step out of the stream, step out of the rush hour traffic 24 seven, rolling through the mind. There's this wonderful little uh, image from Tricycle Magazine I cut out and posted on the wall of my office because I'm talking about myself here as someone who really has pretty strong tendencies to chase the next uh, task, ch chase the next to-do item and get that dopamine hit from accomplishing it. And that this is a verse from the Dhammapada that's laid over a black and white photo taken from behind of clearly a Zen priest in robes, shaved head, and a young child also in similar robes, but much, much smaller, looking out on a, onto a Zen garden uh, with sand and stones on, onto which snow has fallen. And you can just feel the quiet there and the, the serenity and the peacefulness in the image. And uh, the, 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 um, the passage from the Dhammapada, I believe, uh, is pretty close to um, peacefully we dwell among busy people. Among the busy people, peacefully we dwell. Amidst busyness, peacefully we dwell. Peacefully we dwell amidst busyness, right? And you can just feel into, right, how addicted we can kind of get around busyness and chasing this or that, looking for the next stem, doom scrolling, you know, looking for <laughs> your political team scoring points on, putting points on the board. <laughs> you know, what happened in the last seven minutes? I got to stay in touch with all that. You know, you can be chasing all that, speaking for myself. And, um, you know, that is not calm, and that is not steadiness of mind. Uh, last also about content, being content or contentment. Uh, I've written a lot about this, and we understandably activate the second noble truth of craving when we feel like our needs are unmet. Bingo. That's the biology of craving. If, on the other hand, we have a sense of our needs met already in the present enough. In other words, if we have an authentic feeling of in the present, of feeling content, not discontent, not compelled, not driven, not insisting, but rather content, like a basic all rightness plus well-being in the present, whew, then we're disengaged from craving. We're not, we're disengaged from becoming. We're not chasing the next thing. There may still be problems to solve and goals to, to pursue. And in, in my case, you know, recently in Yosemite, a couple of mountains to climb. Uh, yeah, but we can do all that on the basis of feeling already content, already rested in what I call the green zone. So you might become aware of what it feels like to be content. It's really great. And to appreciate how that felt sense of being content connects with a broader process of quieting the mind and um, tranquilizing the body. So here as well, I'd like to pause for half a minute or so and ask you to really 
clarify for yourself how important is calm for you. Not suppressing. There's still a place for hanging out with friends and howling at the moon. I do my fair share of that, actually, um, sometimes literally. There's a place for that. While underneath it all, as this teaching here from Udana puts it, can underneath it all your mind be steady, unmoved, not getting angry about things on the one hand, you know, and invaded by them and hijacked by them, and also not swept away by desire, okay? How important is this for you in the remainder of your life, the cultivation of this underlying calm? Certainly as a factor of the steadiness of presence. Simply sighing is calming. Long exhalations, activating the parasympathetic branch of the nervous system, those are calming. You know, getting out of the war in your head, calming. Feeling peaceful, peace of mind. Is that a value for you? And if so, how could you live that value more in your daily life? Okay, and then um, Gina's question at 10 past, um, what is the green zone? That definitely is a rickism, for better or worse. And um, I want to put a quotation for the third factor of stable presence here, and then I'll respond to that question. Um, <clears throat> let's see, I... I think of, and we know the difference kind of, we know what it's like to be in what we might call the red zone, where we're sort of frazzled, we're upset, we're driven, we're anxious, we're frustrated, we feel hurt or resentful or envious of other people, right? We're kind of stressed. In other words, what is it like when one or more of our three basic needs for safety, for satisfaction, and for connection feels invasively unmet in the moment? Mother Nature's plan is for us, her little babies, her little creatures, her little children, including us, whoop, to go into the red zone when there's an unmet need. There's a place for that. But that process of, of a kind of a pressured, uh, self-referential drivenness that characterizes the red zone is exactly what the Buddha was talking about in terms of the, third, the second noble truth of craving of tanha, whose etymological root is thirst. Something is missing, something is wrong. And in modern life, maybe we're not running for our lives from saber-toothed tigers, but because of multitasking, long working hours, media overwhelm, um, expectations and all the rest, we live in the pink zone, if not the real red zone, much, much, much of the time. Green zone is the alternative to that. It's my metaphor. What is it like when in the moment you feel safe enough or satisfied enough or connected enough in the core of your being? Sometimes you have to help yourself realize that you actually are safe enough and satisfied enough and connected enough in the present. You have to help yourself sometimes uh, through deliberate practice such a, practices such as recognizing that you're all right right now when you are, and usually you are, for safety or deliberate practices of gratitude and gladness for satisfaction and deliberate practices of uh, warming your heart toward others and receiving and noticing the caring that is actually, uh, whatever it is, the caring that is actually true for you. 
These are deliberate practices. So one way or another, you can cultivate the sense of living in the green zone. And um, as you develop psychological strengths of various kinds, you're more and more able to deal with challenges in life that in the past would push you into the red zone, understandably. But now you can cope with them on the basis of an underlying sense of peacefulness, contentment, and love in terms of those three needs in order, um, even as you deal with those challenges. In other words, staying in the green zone while the world around you is flashing red. That's a summary of a lot of material. You can find it in, you know, elaborated, especially in the third chapter of Hardwiring Happiness, including the way this relates to three stages of brain evolution, et cetera. Um, so I just wanted to say that we're full of opportunity, you know, for resting increasingly in the green zone. And um, that sense of um, needs met enough in the moment such that we can experience contentment is a real beautiful ally and um, factor of calming. Okay, so the three factors uh, tonight of steady presence, stability of presence, intention, calming. Now, warm-heartedness. A warm heart steadies the mind. You ever notice that? When your heart feels full, you know, when you're, you know, maybe you're irritated with someone and you, you know, you, and you're, you're thinking about what they did to you and you're part of the matter, even though theirs was bigger, <laughs> you're so in it. Huh. If you kind of say, okay, okay, whatever is true there. Okay. Okay. Let's take a little break. And you feel underneath it all to your warm, natural warm heart, your open heartedness, the, whatever love, it, lovingness is true for you. Maybe there's a sense of flowing into you as well as flowing out from you. What happens? You get steadier. There's a stability that starts coming in. A stability of presence aided by this warming of heart. So I put in the quotation here at 13 minutes past, live without covetous greed and fill your mind with benevolence. And as a result, be mindful and one-pointed, inwardly stable and concentrated. You know, the Buddha is weaving together several things there, or the people who edited his talks, whoever they were, thank you. Um, and I just I want to highlight the one aspect here about filling our mind with benevolence deliberately. So in the present, we can deliberately um, call up and you know, rest our attention on and evoke various aspects of warm-heartedness, like friendliness, ordinary friendliness, to the extent it's authentic, compassion, even for those who are our adversaries. We can vehemently disagree with them. We can oppose them. We can fight them, uh, certainly nonviolently, sometimes perhaps necessarily not so nonviolently. It's a complex topic, and certainly in Buddhism. But fundamentally, we don't, as the Buddha put it, let hatred or ill will invade our mind and remain, which creates room for us to develop over time an increasingly unconditional, radiating, embodying, feeling, and unqualified uh, open-heartedness and warm-heartedness and um, good wishes, goodwill, and compassion through which other beings move, even ones we're really mad at and vehemently oppose. Right? We can cult we we can turn our we can we can call up these feelings, and in particular, as we have these kinds of experiences, we can deliberately take them in again and again and again. So we move from states of warm-heartedness to growing traits of warm-heartedness that are increasingly with us wherever we go. And a couple bits on brain science. The amygdala, <coughs> our little buddy, <laughs> shaped like an almond, a little-ish, deep in the brain, the amygdala, two of them, one on either side in the kind of midbrain area, the subcortex, um, sort of like the alarm bell of the brain. It's tracking opportunities, certainly, but it tends to really track threats. 
and it can be easily sensitized to the tracking of threats. So how do we kind of help that, uh, that alarm bell calm down so that we can be more stably present and not so murdered, preoccupied with threats or opportunities? Well, interestingly, the amygdala has many receptors for oxytocin. Oxytocin being a, a primal neurochemical, uh, a peptide, so the molecule is quite small and slippery. It kind of oozes uh, in the brain. It's not just uh, released in a pulse-like fashion. It's released in what's called a paracrine, P-A-R-A-C-R-I-N-E, uh, kind of uh, release. So it's sort of, you know, in, you can increase oxytocin in this, in, in a way, the soup that bathes uh, the various neurons and related support cells in your own brain. So as uh, oxytocin levels and activity increase, whether in this pulse-like way or more in a steady state kind of way, they have an inhibitory effect on the amygdala. amygdala. Oxytocin activity that reaches the amygdala helps to calm down the alarm bell as a neurological mechanism uh, through which warm-heartedness promotes stability and steadiness of mind. So one more 30-second little interval here of practice. All right, what are your intentions these days? How much do you value the development of traits of warm-heartedness, trait compassion, trait empathy, particularly for people who are different from you. How much is lovingness a value for you to cultivate in the years and days and minutes that are given to you? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Those were the three that I have focused on here as opportunities for practice. Wherever we are, um, <laughs> I practice with these for sure. Uh, my wife probably wishes I practiced even more with them. But anyway, um, intention for a stability of present moment presence. Second, calming, broadly stated, not suppressing, more like pacifying the mind, peaceful, and third, warm-heartedness, okay? Talked about those, and next week I'll add the remaining two, which are uh, feeling things as a whole, a kind of holistic gestalt awareness, really supports stability of presence, and then the ultimate that the Buddha pointed to again and again and again, he didn't kid around and he didn't have a secret teaching only for the cool kids of his time. It was for everybody. He said, you know, um, appreciate and practice and become increasingly aware of, including just intuitively, timelessness, the unconditioned, the stable, unchanging, um, fertile ground of all. So, well, Explore that one next week too. Okay, questions. I think in terms in interest of time, I won't be able to speak with anyone individually. I'm just going to um, move through some comments and questions that have come in the chat. Okay, and if there's anything you take away from tonight, take away whatever was beneficial for you that you came to in those three half minute little pauses or you identified for yourself, okay, Whew. what matters to you about the relevant intentions, calming, and warm-heartedness? Okay, so let's see, a question came in. Why is why are distractions so distracting? Uh, lots of reasons for that. Uh, Jovian points out brain wants novelty and all the rest of it. Um, I think that I really appreciate the 
proverb in, in Buddhism that wisdom is choosing a greater happiness over a lesser one. And I think it's okay, you know, I don't know, at least at my level, <laughs> whatever it is. You know, I, I cut myself slack. All right, I want to go on CNN and see the latest or political Twitter or whatever. Um, you know, just follow some distraction of some kind. But how much? How much? It's a lesser happiness. And what really helps increasingly is to appreciate the greater happiness that you felt while meditating. <sighs> or stepping out of the whirlwind, or you know, letting your mind be full of you know, just hanging out with your partner rather than watching endless TV or something. You know, just the greater happiness. Becoming aware of the greater happiness and appreciating it, feeling it. So more and more your, net, your, your mind and your brain is naturally inclined in that direction. So that instead of having to top down, fight the distractions, more and more bottom up, you just move in a different direction. Okay, great. Let's see here. Great comments, and I really appreciate in the chat how you're focusing on your own practice and um, not advising or teaching or criticizing or educating um, other people. Let's see here. I appreciate Mary Lynn's comment, the, the one word um, she acquired from Mexico, you know, after living there for seven years was, if there's one word, it would be calm. And it is challenging. I see the comment from Jovian 20 minutes after. Um, yeah, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure the monkey mind is designed to sustain stability of presence. Certainly not in our modern go-go, zoom, zoom, threat, threat, pleasure, pleasure, um, disconnected from nature, disconnected from others, disconnected from our own bodies kind of world. You know, you take the monkey mind, the cave, you know, the, the Stone Age brain, drop it into modern life. Yeah, it's not so, it's very vulnerable to cluttered intention, frazzled instead of calm and closed heartedness. So, okay, got it. And that's where we have to practice. So Mary Lynn asked me, I'll speak to this at the very end. How would I apply David Trelevin's approach about trauma-informed mindfulness to this talk? Interesting. I'm not sure entirely. Uh, what kind of comes up for me is that I think that the development of clear intention, top down and bottom up, you know, that doesn't itself take us into trauma material. If anything, it strengthens bulwarks against being invaded and hijacked by trauma material. Same with the cultivation of calm and a warm heart. We can deliberately focus on developing wholesome qualities, and if the brain associates to the opposite and tries to distract us there, we can still exercise the muscle we are increasingly cultivating of steadiness of mind to acknowledge that distraction and say, thank you for sharing. No, I'm not going to feed that and I'm not going to follow it. It might continue bubbling in the background, murmuring away, yelling away, and Murk! I'm putting my attention on that which is positive and useful and beneficial for me right now. I'm going to use my will. Everyone has that capacity. You might have to swing the spotlight and vacuum cleaner of attention again and again over to what's beneficial, like a growing sense of calm or a growing sense of warm-heartedness. That includes a warm heart for yourself that looks out for you. You might have to do that thousands of times. But that exercise of the will over attention in the moment is available to almost all of us. Maybe in the moment that we're really overwhelmed and hijacked, it's not. But fairly quickly, we can choose what to focus on. And that choice is an existential one. No one can make it for us, and no one can rob us of the capacity for us, generally speaking. 
There are exceptions to this. A brain that is increasingly dementing or is delirious um, or is very young doesn't have that executive capacity to, con to redirect attention again and again. But for the rest of us, and I think I just imagine everyone in this gathering tonight, we can redirect attention deliberately. There's no evading that responsibility, generally speaking. And um, over time, as we direct our attention in muscular ways to that which is wholesome, beneficial, and the greater happiness, that increasingly becomes our habit, the habit of our heart. And it takes less and less deliberate effort to change the channel, to shift into that other way of being because it becomes more natural. It's more hardwired, literally, into our own nervous system and body. That's what I would say about the potential applications of David's approach of trauma-informed mindfulness to the cultivation of intention, calming, and a warm heart.